good morning. Um, let me just check that the microphone is working. Is that clear? Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, um, Sigrid. Um, <coughs> it's always a pleasure to be here in, the, in Singapore. And before I forget, I'd like to thank Property Guru um, for um, inviting me here today. Now, the title of my talk today is, as you can see, China's Asian Dream. And as Sigrid um, just introduced, it is also, and there's no, no coincidence here, it's, it is also the name um, of my newest book, um, which is about what China is doing across Asia, about its ambitions in Asia, and about how it's trying to realize um, those ambitions, specifically through infrastructure diplomacy. Um, and the major policy it's using um, is the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, for, for my book, I spent two years wandering around um, the border regions of China um, and also in neighboring countries. So across uh, mainland um, Southeast Asia, in Central Asia, and South Asia as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But to start, I thought I should talk about um, what's going on in the news right now. Could I just ask, am I very, very loud? It does sound very loud to me. No? Good. All right. And at this point, normally in the talk, I would like to make a joke or two because nobody wants to hear a very serious talk at half past nine in the morning. But I'm afraid that I have to start with some very, very serious news, and this is not a joking matter. So, hang on. There it is, right? Nobody should joke about this man, Mr. Xi Jinping, um, because if you joke about this man, you end up in jail. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to do that. In fact, um, all I will say um, about this man is that he's a very great leader, a man of enormous vision, and somebody who we should respect enormously. But to be serious um, for, for a moment, um, I think what Xi Jinping thinks is extraordinarily important. As we saw at, at the 19th Party Congress, that's the Communist Party Congress that finished in Beijing about 10 days ago, this man here is the most powerful leader China has had for a very long time, um, probably since Chairman um, Mao. Um, and so what he thinks matters enormously. He, he is going to be, whether officially or not, he is going to be the man who dominates China probably for the next 10 or 20 years. Now, what does Xi Jinping want? Well, he's actually been at times arrogantly clear about what he wants. So when Xi Jinping first became chairman of the Communist Party, five years ago, um, almost the first thing he did was to define his grand vision for, for his leadership. And he called that the China or the Chinese dream. And this is really what I'm playing off when I talk about China's Asian dream. I'm looking at the sort of foreign policy implications of the Chinese dream. And he defined this as realizing the great um, re rejuvenation or the great renewal of the Chinese nation. But he didn't exactly explain what he meant by that. So what did he mean? Well, I think to understand what he meant, you have to go back and look at history briefly. Now, I don't have time to go into this too much, but I think it's, it's what we can say is that if you go back little more than 200 years or so to the late 18th century, um, China, this is, this is official sort of communist his, history, but there's, some, but there's certainly truth in it. China was the most powerful civilization state in Asia. It was um, a state which, in the sort of Chinese view of the world, in Chinese cosmology, sat at the center of the world. That's why China is called Zhongguo in Chinese. It literally means Middle Kingdom. It was a country that was surrounded by tributary states, um, Korea, Vietnam, Japan, and then beyond that, states which had little contact um, with this great civilization, which were known in Chinese, in one translation, as barbarian states. But then from the sort of early, mid 19th century, this all began to unravel. First, my compatriots, the British, arrived with their gunboats um, off Canton, Guangzhou, as it's called um, in Chinese. Um, and that was the start of the Opium Wars. And then in the middle of the century, you had the Taiping Rebellion, which was the biggest civil war in, in history. Towards the end of the century, you had the Sino-Japanese -Jap War when China lost. So it lost to someone, a country that had been a little brother within the Confucian system, which was deeply embarrassing for China. 
And then into the 20th century, you had the fall of the Qing dynasty, then you had warlordism, and then you had the Japanese invasion. Um, and by um, 1949, um, when the Chinese Communist Party established the People's Republic of China, you know, China really was, was battered um, and backward. And so it really was the job of the Communist Party to um, rebuild the country. And the way Xi Jinping looks at um, Chinese history, modern Chinese history, is to divide it into three 30-year periods, roughly. The first 30-year period um, under Mao Zedong was when China sort of, sort of brought back some self-respect, if you like. It, it began to rebuild, it began to build institutions again. After that, you had um, Deng Xiaoping, who came and began the reform and opening process. And now you have the, the new era, as he calls it, of Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping's first job is to bring moderate um, prosperity to the country by the centenary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party in 2021. That means that China will be a reasonably rich country and everyone will be living comfortably, that's the idea. And then the grand aim by mid-century, by the centenary of the founding of the People's Republic is national rejuvenation. Now, what does that mean? Well, fortunately, 10 days ago, Xinhua, the, the state media agency, gave us a very clear definition. If we were in any doubt as to what this meant, it means that China is set to regain its might and reascend to the top of the world. And the way I look at this is that I think China wants to be initially to the east as the US is to, to the west. It wants to regain primacy. It wants to restore what it's lost. So this is the rejuvenation. In Chinese, it's called fuxing, which means to restore what, what was there before. So this is, this is Xi Jinping's sort of grand Chinese dream and his, what I would call his Asian dream. Now, how is China going to get there? Well, of course, we all know that it's building a very strong military and we, you know, we see what China's doing in the South China Sea. And recently, Xi Jinping also spoke about um, building one of the world's strongest mil militaries by the middle of the century. But I don't think China um, is out there to invade anybody um, at the moment. The way it wants to become strong is to use its enormous economic might, its financial heft, um, to sort of push its tentacles out across Asia. And the specific policy it's using to do that is the Belt and Road Initiative, also known as One Belt, One Road, Yi Da Yi Lu in Chinese. And this picture here is of Xi Jinping at the Belt and Road Forum, which took place in Beijing in May, where he was really trying to persuade the world that this grand policy isn't something to be frightened of, that it is what the Chinese call win-win, um, and that this is to everyone's mutual benefit, and that China is trying to build a community of common destiny um, across Asia and beyond. And uh, I'll get to whether that's really true a little bit later in the talk. But for the moment, I think we should define what the belt and the road are. Now, I'm actually quite reluctant to use maps because I think maps give um, a rather false impression of what this is. Um, this map here, though, is a very, very basic rendering um, of the Silk Road economic belt. It's a map that I made two or three years ago, and you know, I, I want to be very clear that it's not really accurate because there is no definable belt and there is no definable road. We don't even know exactly which countries um, are involved. There is a list of 65-ish countries, but the Chinese government has been very deliberate in keeping this very, very broad and very, very open. And I think it's actually better to think of the belt and the road as, um, as a, a, a sort of list of broad policy aims rather than a specific list um, of policies. Now, it is the case, or projects, sorry. Now, it is the case that China's State Planning Department, the National um, Development and Reform Commission, does have a list of projects, but it's, it's a state secret. Um, and that only really refers to um, state companies and what they're doing. But I think abroad, almost anything can be defined as Belt and Road if it's in, if it's in Asia and in parts of Eastern Europe. 
But anyway, Silk Road Economic Belt is really about building connectivity in all forms across the Eurasian continent. So that not only means um, road and rail, it also means power grids, it means pipelines, it means fiber op optic cables, it means trying to develop industrial clusters. And um, the most famous route um, are the freight railway lines that, that sort of went their way from eastern China right across northwestern China and then through Kazakhstan and into eastern Europe. Um, last year, 1,700 trains um, made that journey. But there are several economic corridors that also sort of feed off this main line. Um, the most interesting one, I think, or the most relevant one for this audience um, is, the, is the line that wends its way down from Kunming um, in Yunnan that goes down through Laos, through Thailand, Malaysia, and will end up um, in, in Singapore. Um, here are a couple photos um, I took while I was on the road. Um, the first one on the left says Ya O Bei Lu, which literally means um, Asia, Europe, North Road. Um, and this I took um, on the border in Korgos, on the China-Kazakhstan border. Um, the, the photo on the right-hand side is what you might call the Nan Lu. It's the southern road, which goes from Kashgar, which is the most westerly major city in Asia, um, and then winds its way um, through, the, through the desert there, and then across the Pamir Mountains into Kyrgyzstan. Um, and this is a brand new road that the, that the Chinese um, have built. Um, and um, what was remarkable about going through this region is that um, I got perfect mobile phone reception there. Now, I, I live in Oxford in the UK now, and I have terrible reception there, but in China, you can go anywhere, and the infrastructure is amazing. And this is what it's all about, really. It's about building connectivity across Asia. Now, to move on to the um, Maritime Silk Road. Now, it's, it's a little confusing in English because this Silk Road is at sea. It makes more sense in Chinese, Hai Lu, but in English, a, a, a maritime road does sound a little strange. Nevertheless, this is really about building um, better connectivity, um, new trade links, new trade routes, new ports through the South China Sea, through the Indian Ocean, um, and then... Um, actually doesn't show it here, but the east coast of Africa, but up through the Red Sea into the Mediterranean. I've also marked on this map the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is also one of the major land routes um, that China um, is, is, is building currently. Um, the, the numbers you hear keep on going up. Originally, they were talking about investments and loans worth 46 billion US dollars. It's now risen to, to 62 billion dollars. And I think it's, this is worth looking at in a little more detail because it, it, this, this gets to the kind, of, the kind of crux of the fears about what China's doing. Now, there's no doubt that China can bring an awful lot of benefits to Asia. And when it talks about win-win, that can certainly be true. You know, what China is really saying is we have lots of money, we have the savings of 1.4 billion people, and we have a huge current account surplus because we have massive ex exports. Um, and we also have a bunch of very experienced engineering companies that have been building infrastructure across China for the last 15, 20 years. Then it goes to countries like Pakistan, you know, less developed countries that need an awful lot of infrastructure. It can say to them, look, we've got all this, you're lacking infrastructure, so this is win-win. We will come lend you lots of money at a reasonable price, mostly, but not always true. And our engineering firms, mainly state-owned, can come in and build it for you. So, so this is very, very good indeed. The problem is, is that many countries fear that this is less a commercial play than a strategic play. And I think the truth is it's a little bit of both. But I was speaking to um, somebody in Beijing recently who is very connected to the Chinese government, which is why I can't mention his, his name. But he also does a lot of work um, in, in Pakistan. And he said, look, what's happening in Pakistan, it isn't really commercial. You know? It's about a couple of things. In the first place, it's strategic. You know, China wants to build pipelines from the Arabian Sea. Um, and that means that it's diversifying um, its import routes so that it can avoid the Straits of Malacca, which you know, China's always worried that the US can, um, um, can blockade it. But he said, what it's really about though, even more so, is that China is terrified of um, Islamic extremism, fundamentalism, terrorism um, 
being, um, being um, fomented in, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Tajikistan, and that coming over the border into Xinjiang where you know, China fears the Uyghur independence movement. And he was saying what this is really about is just a giant bribe to the Pakistani government saying, look, we will lend you and in some cases give you lots of money if you sort this out for us. And I don't think that China really expects to get a lot of its money back there. Now, that's not always the case in other places, um, but here, this is very much a strategic play, and that is what worries India in particular. Now, this picture um, is of the Colombo South Container Terminal in Sri Lanka, which I also um, visited. And, you know, this is clearly, in the first place, a commercial um, port. And it's a very, very impressive port. It has, I was told at least, the highest gantry cranes in the world, along with those in Shanghai. And this is probably the best port um, in the south of South Asia. But it's also owned by China Merchants, um, which is a listed company in Hong Kong, but its mother company um, is a Chinese state-owned firm. Um, and in India in particular, um, they worry that this um, is, is part of a deliberate Chinese ploy um, to kind of build what they call a string of pearls, a noose, if you like, around the neck of Mother India, because China also has interests in ports. There's Gwadar, which I just showed you in Pakistan. There's Karachi. There's Colombo here. There's Hambantota in the south um, of the island. Um, there's also Chalk Pew um, in, um, um, in Myanmar. And there's some other interests, too. Now, even if these ports are commercial, as this one really is, and actually this port will be handed back to um, the Sri Lankan government in about 25 years' time, they can potentially be used for military purposes. And so India got very upset when a Chinese nuclear-powered sub docked here a couple of times um, two years ago. Now, I do think actually India overplays some of these worries. Um, but I, I, it's something that is very, very important because China is struggling to build trust, um, I think, in the belt and the road. The more it does that appears to be strategic, the less people really believe that it's a purely commercial play. I think I'll skip through this and, and move on to, on, on, on to China's attempt to try to persuade people that what it's doing really is in their best interests. Now, um, during the Belt and Road Forum, or sort of in that, at, at that sort of time, um, the Chinese media came out with all sorts of attempts to, to make China look a lot friendlier and fluffier than a lot of people think it is. And one of the things it was doing was to come up with these Belt and Road bedtime stories, um, explaining why the Belt and the Road um, um, was, was going to be good um, and positive for all the countries along it. But I think the very fact um, that it had to do this um, shows um, how difficult it is for China to gain pe people's trust. And I think one of the problems here is, is that obviously China's political system makes it difficult for people to trust it. And you know, if you look at how um, sort of China and Chinese um, state-owned firms behave, um, it, it also makes them difficult to trust. China is very, very good at whining and dining um, foreign um, leaders who look rather like Chinese leaders. So, for example, it's very comfortable in Central Asia, um, in sort of countries such as um, Tajikistan and Kazakhstan, where it can sort of talk to other authoritarian um, leaders. But the problem for China is that when the um, political winds shift, it can find itself in a very, very difficult position. And I think one good example here is Myanmar, um, which... A few years ago, you know, China was really Myanmar's um, only friend, and it was investing a huge amount of money um, in um, a very large dam in that country, um, a three point, I think it was $3.4 billion dam at Miet, at Miet Zone. Um, and it also had um, an understanding to build a $20 billion um, dollar, um, railway through the country too. Um, and when the military junta there dissolved itself, um, all of these were either postponed or cancelled. And I think that's a very, very good, a good example of how some of the plans that China has with the Belt and the Road may never happen, which is why it's important not to see this as a clear list because what actually gets built will really depend on political vagaries, on deal-making that may or may not happen. I think another good example is to look at Sri Lanka, um, 
where two or three years ago, you know, China was in a very good position with the previous regime um, when, when um, Raja Paksa was the leader. Um, and you know, they did a lot of deals there. But when um, the new government came into power in January 20, 2015, they decided um, that they should relook at, at all the Chinese deals. Now, as it turns out, um, you know, the, the Sri Lankan government looked for other people to kind of fund their in infrastructure, and you know, there wasn't much forthcoming, and so they've had to turn back to the, to the Chinese. Um, and in some cases, um, debt deals, when China has been lending money, have now been turned into equity, so now China has ended up owning, for example, Hamban Tota port um, in, the, in the south. And I think this is also something that people might begin to worry about. That you know, if China actually sort of owns infrastructure abroad, that gives it tremendous power. And I think you know what China is doing here is it's, it's building um, a trade and investment nexus lubricated by Chinese money. And it may not be in the first place China's aim to try to um, to try to um, increase its its sort of geopolitical leverage um, in the, in the region. But that is what will happen. You know, the stronger China becomes economically, the more dependent other countries will become on it. And we see this very, very clearly in countries such as Laos and Cambodia, small countries that find it very, very difficult to stay independent um, of China. Now, so I've been talking about how it's hard to trust China. But the problem is, who else is out there? Um, until you know, quite recently, um, the the U.S. was a very, very was, was clearly a very, very strong presence in Asia, and a presence that could be trusted. So since the Second World War, you know, um, and, and the U.S. has built up a very strong alliance system in the region, and this is something that you know that um, that China, frankly, scares China. So if you're Chinese and you look out around you, you see U.S. alliances everywhere. You know, the U.S. has. Um, official military alliances with Korea, with Japan, with the Philippines, with Thailand, with Australia. It has a very close relationship with Singapore. You know, there are lots of U.S. Um, troops based here. It has a, uh, an ever-growing um, relationship now um, with, um, uh, uh, with Vietnam as well. Um, and under the previous U.S. government, you know, Barack Obama um, talked about a pivot to Asia or what became a rebalance to Asia. Now, I think a lot of people in the region began to feel that the pivot wasn't really happening and it was a bit of a damp squib. But one thing that um, the Obama administration did take very seriously indeed was the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, and this was really about um, sort of committing the US to its presence in Asia and sort of showing the region that the US sort of cared about Asia. But it was also clearly a geopolitical ploy to, um, to try to preempt um, China's um, leadership in the region too. Ash Carter, the previous defense secretary, um, said that TPP mattered to him as much as having um, a, um, a, an extra aircraft carrier in the South China, China, China Sea. So you can clearly see that it also had um, a geopolitical um, meaning too. Now, of course, um, under um, the US's wonderful new, uh, wonderful new leader, Don Donald Trump, you know, the US commitment to the region is now much more uncertain than it once was. Now, you know, Donald Trump is in Asia at the moment, um, and we'll have to see what he says, but as far as we can see, there is no clear strategy from the new administration. And actually, on his current tour of the region, he hasn't brought any of his top trade or economic representatives with him. And so, I think, you know, China does look big, it, do it does look scary, but it's also your neighbor. You know, in, in Southeast Asia in particular, you have no choice but to work um, with China. Um, and one thing you cannot doubt is China's commitment to the region. So, frankly, I mean, you may not trust China, but you may begin to trust its commitment more, more to the region than you trust the commitment of Donald Trump. Now, what's next for the region? Well, with the death of TPP, I say death, of course, you know, um, the US quit TPP, the first thing that Trump really, really, really did as, as leader. And the remaining countries may or may not um, go, go, go ahead with it, but it's clearly now um, a, a much smaller trade deal um, than it once was. Now, the only really mega trade deal on the table is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, um, RCEP. And I think this potentially could be a very, very big deal indeed. 
Now, the major difference between TPP and RCEP, of course, is that RCEP includes China. Um, but not only China, it also includes Indonesia, which is a large economy. And I think very, very importantly indeed, it includes potentially India, you know, um, Asia's other giant, um, and also South Korea as well. And it looks as though um, at the APEC meeting next week that more progress will be made towards, um, um, towards making RCEP a real thing. Um, and I think you know, this is very important because it dovetails with the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, this is really another policy which, this is not officially China-led, it's ASEAN-led, but China really is pushing it very, very hard. And China's um, GDP accounts for sort of half the GDP of the RCEP countries. This is about integrating Asia. So the Belt and the Road um, are about integrating Asia through new infrastructure in the main. RCEP is about building a new institution which can help integrate Asia too. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of economics and business, this could be extraordinarily positive. Um, you know, whereas in the West, particularly it seems in Britain, um, my country, and in the US, people now seem to be doubting the value um, of free trade. This is something that people in Asia are still remain absolutely, com absolutely committed to. And Xi Jinping was earlier this year at Davos, you know, standing up in front of the world and saying, look, I'm now the man who um, supports global free trade and global um, investment. Now, this is a little disingenuous. You know, China is still very protectionist when it comes to investment, at least. But when it comes to trade, China has done very well out of it, and as has Asia. So there was a real appetite here, I think, for more trade. Um, so I think, you know, what we're moving towards in Asia is a more sort of integrated continent. And I think that will bring um, a big um, business benefits. Now, I'm going to outline a few sort of very broad points here. I don't want to get into too much detail because we have Rafik who will, who will talk next about the, th um, about the specifics of what One Belt, One Road can bring. But I think in the first place, it's worth thinking simply in GDP growth terms. The Asian Development Bank estimates that the region needs $1.7 trillion worth of infrastructure investment every year just to keep current growth rates at their current level. Now, I think this number is plucked out of thin air. I mean, nobody really knows how much investment is needed. What we do know is that we do need um, plenty, um, and that a lot of parts of Asia, particularly, say, in mainland Southeast Asia, are not actually very, very well connected um, at the moment. And so plans such as China's high-speed rail link from Kunming all the way down to Singapore could make an enormous difference. But for people in, in real estate in Southeast Asia, it may take some time, I think, for the full benefits um, of the Belt and Road um, um, to, um, to, to become apparent. Because I think in the first place, you know, building infrastructure takes time. Um, and this will really be about Chinese um, government state-owned enterprises working alongside local, pr uh, local enterprises um, to, you know, to build the roads, the railways, the ports. That takes time. If you like, that's the skeleton. And it, you need a little bit of time to put the flesh on the bones. But certainly, once those are built, there will be enormous opportunities for real estate investments around them. You know, once you have railway stations, once you have ports, then you need shops, you need hotels. Um, also, you know, another big part of this is simply the movement of people. You know, I think those countries that work closely with China, you will see enormous increases in Chinese tourism. And that means you need new hotels and new restaurants and new resorts. So I think you know, there is enormous potential here. So in business terms, for those countries that want to work with, with China, you can do very, very well out of it. But of course, I'm also acutely aware, speaking to people in the region, that many of them don't want to become sort of mere satellites within, within the Chinese um, solar system. Um, and that you know, people want to maintain their independence. And I think that, that will be the challenge for the, for, for the region in the future. How do you benefit from China's enormous investments and China's loans without becoming too dependent on China? Um, and I think, depending on your perspective, um, you, know, you can call it either China's Asian dream or what may become, in time, an Asian nightmare. Thank you very much. One last thing, sorry. Um, this is my book. If you want to buy it, it's on Amazon. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so let's open the floor to questions. Uh, anyone? Or I can kick it off. 
So, Tom, thanks so much. It's a great presentation. Um, I just wanted to, to ask you about uh, looking at the plants. It seems like the one from Kunming to Singapore will be the most beneficial to the entire ASEAN region. And I wanted to check. Um, you said that it seems like there's still like uh, skepticism in terms of the implementation. What do you think is the probability of that happening? And if it is happening, what time frame are we looking at? Well, I can show you that um, that it that it is is happening now. So, um, um, I mean, I've um, the the initial highway that runs from Kunming um, down into northern Laos, um, and then across the Mekong River into Thailand has been built. I mean, I've taken that highway, and I did that it was three years ago now. Um, but I think the uh, the uh, the initial problem there was really with the railway, um, which is which is the major part 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 of this. And there were some problems. Um, with the funding of it, you know, obviously it's very, very expensive. You know, they guesstimate it'll cost more than seven billion dollars, um, which is a huge amount. Sorry, this is just in Laos, which is a huge amount of Laos's um, GDP. Um, and there are big, big fears that this will leave Laos utterly dependent on China, and, and they have no way pay of, of, of paying it back. But this has now gone through um, the Laotian um, Parliament, and they are they have started work on it. So, a friend of mine um, is a photographer. And he was down in Laos recently taking photographs with the, um, with the New York Times. And he, he took some fantastic photos um, of, of Chinese workers there sort of um, um, plowing tunnels um, through, through the mountains um, of northern Laos. So it really is happening. And as I'm sure people here know much better um, than I do, you know, they are also working very, very hard um, on the link um, through Malaysia as well. So I, I don't know exactly how long it will take. Um, you know, I know that Thailand is also building um, the kind of middle link too at the moment. Um, but it's you know it is cert it is certainly it's moved from the um, from the design stage um, into into actual imp imp implementation. Thank you. Uh, questions from the floor. Okay, none. Just I have one more though <laughs> on the funding. Because uh, this is a very massive project, as you've mentioned, and I think it's the most ambitious one I've seen, at least you know, for uh, Asia Pacific, even globally. Uh, I've seen estimates about four trillion to eight trillion dollars. I think that's what uh, the Economist has put out there. You know what they've, what they've seen. Um, my, you know, for me, you know, that's an eye-popping number. Where will the funding come from? Does China have something in place? Right, um, I think in the first place you had to ignore all of the headline numbers, right? Nobody has any idea how much money is going to go into this because as I was explaining, it's not really clearly defined. and We don't know what will be built, you know? Um, so that's one thing. Um, then I think, yes, a lot of it will come from China, but I think one important aspect of the financing that is misunderstood is that this is all gonna be Chinese investment. It's not. It's mainly going to be um, Chinese loans. Okay, where are they going to um, come from? Well, mainly from China's policy banks. So that's China Development Bank and China um, Export and Import, well, sorry, the Export Import Bank of China, 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 China Exim Bank. Now, um, those two policy banks say that um, by the end of 2016, last year, they had already lent a little over a quarter of a trillion um, dollars on Belt and Road projects. Now, again, you have to be careful with these numbers because you know, we don't know exactly what is a Belt and Road, road um, project, but it's a very, very large number. I, I, I think another institution that's gained a lot of headlines is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, because when that was founded, it was seen as sort of China, um, almost as a sort of, sort of trying to create a, a sort of competitor to some of the existing Bretton Woods institutions out there, trying to, if you like, sort of create an alternative international system. Um, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration. What they're really trying to do is to kind of augment or supplement um, the existing institutions out there. And actually, because the AIIB was far more successful than anyone in China thought it would be, in other words, you know, it's attracted stakeholders from not only, just, not, not only from all over Asia, but also from places like Germany and Britain, Canada. Um, it now has to be basically a, a sort of very standard, boring, multilateral development bank. And it's actually... Um, disassociated itself from the belt and the road, saying that it's not an arm of Chinese policy. But I think more importantly is it's just very small. It's only lending about $2 billion a year at the moment. So it's not really about the AIB. So really, it's much more about China's policy banks. 
but also it's not just about China, and I think this is important too. You know, if China's going to sort of help build or help push infrastructure over its borders, it has to cooperate with all these other countries too. And I think that was one of the um, reasons behind the Belt and Road Forum. Um, and also, you know, China is really helping to catalyze huge competition in the region. I mean, Japan has always been a big investor, particularly here in Southeast Asia. Um, and um, because it's scared of China's rise, it's now going to be investing more. So um, Abe has promised that um, Japan will invest $200 billion over the next five years. And you, know, you can see this sort of infrastructure um, sort of arms race, if you like, happening across the region. I think sort of one, one kind of lovely um, illustration of this is if you go to Phnom Penh, um, you, 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 you can see the old bridge um, over the river there, over the Mekong, which was built by the Japanese, but just a few hundred meters along, there's a sort of parallel bridge, and it's this bigger, um, better, you know, a shinier bridge built by the Chinese. But then, you know, the Japanese um, have built, you know, sort of, if you go, say, to Hanoi, they built the airport there. You know, if you go to Ho Chi Minh City, you, you see lots and lots of Japanese investors, um, more, more so than you do Chinese. So I think this is all very, very helpful for, for the region. So I, I think that, you know, it, it, it's catalyzing com com competition, which means that you're going to see a huge um, push out of infrastructure across South, Southeast Asia. Thank you. Um, any questions? One more question? Yeah. Well, I'll just ask again. <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, will the IMF, I mean, you know, uh, participate in this? Because uh, I'm thinking um, one of the issues, at least how I, what I foresee here, is that if you've got the various countries participating, even the government, the currency, um, I'm wondering how that would play out because uh, there's so much, you know, if I look at, uh, you know, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, then um, Singapore. Singapore has the strongest currency, obviously, but the others, you know, very volatile. So I'm wondering, like, how this would play out, and given, you know, a lot of these countries are also having some deficits, mm. right? So um, how will that uh, kind of work out? Well, I think one of the initial impulses behind the Belt and the Road um, was to internationalize um, the renminbi, okay? Um, but actually, I think that has sort of rather fallen by the wayside um, in recent years. I, I think long term, you know, China would like the RMB to become the leading currency in the region. So a little bit like a euro or say a Deutschmark um, of the region. But of course, you know, a, a 18 months ago or so, there were big problems with capital outflows um, in China, and China spent basically a trillion dollars of its forex reserves, propping up the value of its currency. So I think now they're being much more controlled. Um, about um, sort of RMB use in the region. But also I think possibly even more practically, um, you know, funding in whether it's RMB or whether it's other local currencies is very expensive. The cost of capital is much, much higher than say borrowing in dollars. So you know, dollars are still very, very cheap. Um, and so you know, if you look at the deals done um, so far, most of it is denominated in dollars. So I think for the moment this is very much a dollar play. Good stuff, thank you. All right, uh, I think that's it. So uh, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you.